Good morning. Welcome to Wednesdays in the Word here at Our Shepherd Lutheran Church in Birmingham, Michigan. I'm Pastor Steve Woodfin, and you can find us at OurShepherd.net. And we're going through 60 essential Bible stories in the Old and New Testament, and we are to Exodus chapter 1 through 15, the story of Moses and Pharaoh. And you can see the victorious lamb window is immediately to my left here. Uh, not really well lit, but you can still kind of make it out. Uh, and, and we're here for very specific reasons because we're talking about the Passover lamb and the Paschal lamb. We're talking about the sacrificial lambs of the Old Testament and the New Testament as we look at the story over 15 chapters of Exodus of Moses and Pharaoh interacting, of course, with God orchestrating and working through Moses and Aaron and the others um, throughout this narrative. And it's our narrative. It's our story. So let's listen to our story as we begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Of course, we cannot go through 15 chapters in seven minutes. Uh, I did do a lot of preparation for this uh, video, though, and I've got four pages of notes that I will share on Facebook and YouTube in the notes area so you can kind of see the synopsis of each of the 15 chapters, uh, a look at all of the 10 plagues, as well as some notes from the LSB. Um, especially regarding um, the hardening of the heart that we hear Pharaoh um, does to himself several times, and then ultimately God does it. And we'll talk about why he does that too. But really what I want to talk about as we look at the key verses, um, which are Exodus 2, verses 23 through 25, um, are some key points uh, about this story being our story and how we can walk into it and live into it in our lives every day. So here are the key verses. <clears throat> During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. There's four verbs there that describe how God responded to the pleas for mercy of, the, of his people, of the chosen people of Israel. These four verbs, heard, remembered, saw, and knew. They show his response to the people. God never forgets his promises. He delivers on those promises in the right time in the right way, and with absolute certainty that he has fulfilled his promise. So think about the promise he made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, as it's mentioned in these key verses of Exodus 2, verses 23 to 25. Now God hears his people crying, and now he chooses to respond. God always keeps his promises, but he doesn't always do them the way we expect in the timing that we want. Does he? In fact, rarely does he. In fact, if, if we look at this whole narrative, if we look at how God calls Moses to go and be his spokesman and tell Pharaoh, let my people go, why didn't God just make it happen? Or when Moses made the request, why didn't God choose to just cause Pharaoh to say, yes, you can go, and off they would go into the promised land. Instead, there's this 15 chapter torturous journey of plague after plague of, of Pharaoh promising to let the people go if the plague would just be removed only to harden his heart once the plague was lifted by God. Again and again, the cycle. And of course, uh, uh, during this process, Pharaoh also increased the workload of the Jewish people as well as uh, the physical beatings that they were experiencing because they weren't making the, the quota that they were supposed to. It, it just became miserable. Why didn't God just free them? Why didn't he just make it happen? Well, we look at that story, and then we look at the story of our Paschal Lamb, Jesus Christ, and how he came to earth and walked it for three years and went through extremely difficult circumstances. And of course, all the way to the point of his torturous death on the cross of Calvary. God uses the fallenness of this world to show his glory. God uses the wretchedness and the sin and 
all the chaos and the mess that we live in because of our own failings, he uses it to point to himself, to help us to realize, to remember again and again who he is and what he can do, how he can overcome all circumstances and give, and give us that eternal hope of his promise fulfilled. In the time of this writing, in Exodus 1 through 15, his promise of delivering his people that Moses came to deliver at the very first time he and Aaron met with the elders of Israel. And they did, they, they believed, they fell down, they worshiped. And then of course, they began to doubt and groan and complain as the plagues went on and on and on. But in each case, as God promised the plague and delivered, he gave the children of Israel another reason to see him to truly see who he was and the power that he had over all creation, to trust in him, to say, yes, Lord, I trust that you will keep the promise that you made, not in the way that I expect, but that you will do it. And the same is true for us today, not only for our salvation, which God has accomplished in Christ, but in the things that he promised us for us in this life and the life to come. Rarely in the way that we expect, but always in a way that is convincing and absolute and sure, God keeps his promises with the sacrificial lamb of the Old Testament and the Passover and with our sacrificial lamb, now our victorious lamb, Jesus Christ. Point number one. Point number two, the Passover is the central redemptive act of the Old Testament. And of course, Christ on the cross and the empty tomb is the central redemptive act, not only of the New Testament, but of, of all creation, of all history of the world. And we see that we are transported from death to life through the blood of the sacrificial lamb, the people of the Passover by the blood painted on their doorposts, and us today by the blood shed on the cross of Calvary. We are delivered from death to life by the blood of the sacrificial lamb. And we also have that faith and trust and hope that we are freed from oppression. Just as the children of Israel were freed from oppression, of the Egyptians, we are free from the oppression of sin and death and the devil by the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood changes everything for us. And then third, finally, that the whole understanding of the hardness of heart. You know, throughout the 10 different plagues, we see uh, 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 Pharaoh depicted as one who is hardening his heart. Until we get to the sixth plague, I think it's the plague of boils where it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Almost as if God were saying, are you sure that's the way you want it? Are you sure? Okay, then here you go. I'm gonna give you what you want. I'm gonna give you what you've chosen. And he brings this judgment on Pharaoh for what Pharaoh has already clearly chosen and will not change his direction from. Pharaoh hardens his heart again and again. And finally, it's too late. Once God hardens the heart, the heart is hardened indeed. And look what happened. The complete destruction of Pharaoh's army, the, the falling of Egypt, um, the destruction due to all the plagues. Pharaoh's hardened heart brought absolute defeat for himself and for Egypt. And of course, absolute victory for the children of Israel. I say that to say this, are there people around us today who are in danger of hardening their hearts? Are there people that we need to pray for and to minister to, to share the love of Christ with? People that we might know in our, in our work or maybe even our home, our friends, our neighborhood, where we, where we go for our children's sports teams, for recreation? Do we know people who seem to be on the edge of that hardening of heart? People we certainly need to pray for and people that we can deliver the love of God to again and again in the hopes that their hearts do not become permanently hardened to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here are a couple of notes from the Lutheran Study Bible about hardening of heart. And the question that is asked is, did God want Pharaoh to be damned? It's a great question, right? If God chose to harden Pharaoh's heart, was it God's will that Pharaoh be cast into hell and separated from him for eternity? Here's one thought on that. This was not because God had begrudged him salvation or because it had been his good pleasure that Pharaoh should be damned and lost, for God is not willing that any should perish, as we know from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And also, 
God had no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's from Ezekiel 33, verse 11. God was saddened at the thought of Pharaoh and the other Egyptians being lost to him. He gave them every opportunity uh, through plague after plague after plague. So not only ministering to the, to the Israelites and showing his power, his wonder, his glory, and giving them every reason to trust in him for the deliverance he promised, but also demonstrating to the Egyptians again and again and again who he was, that they should put their faith and trust in him alone too. See the wonders and then look to the king. Just as Jesus walked this earth and perform many wonders, not for the sake of the wonder itself, but to point to himself as the savior of mankind and to point to his father, the God of creation as well. So look for those people in your life that may have a, a dangerous leaning toward a hardening of heart and know that God can work through us and others to bring his love and to soften that heart so the spirit can bring a, an enduring and saving faith. Let's pray about that right now. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt and for our deliverance, Lord, from the oppression of sin and death through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that we can walk in that promise each and every day and realize as we look in creation, as we look at these stories again and again, Lord, that we can trust you, that you are a God who sees us and who never forgets his promises. And when he chooses to keep them, as you always do, Lord, you do it in a way that is absolute and complete and total. Lord, bless us all that we can see the people around us whose hearts are hardened or approaching that hardness, Lord, so that we can, by your grace and your Holy Spirit's power, minister to them with the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace today and forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.